Welcome to Rev Up Your Business with Hilda Gann, the podcast for people-centric leaders, business owners, and HR professionals who know that people are at the heart of business success. Join me and industry experts as we explore the key aspects of building a thriving company, sharing cutting-edge strategies, impactful insights, and the latest trends to help you ignite your business growth. It's time to rev up your leadership, rev up your success. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Rev Up Your Business. Today we're going to talk about bridging the divide, how to foster inclusive conversations on race. Today my guest is Natalie Haynes. She is the founder CEO of Natalie Haynes Consulting. She's an educator, a workshop facilitator, registered psychotherapist, and a speaker. Natalie's approach also combines her 13 years on in logistics and supply chain, which includes various management roles at Canadian Tire Corporation. Natalie uses her varied experience to facilitate experiential workshops, online courses on mental health, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Her signature program entitled The Comfortable Race Conversation Process leads individuals through an experiential process to learn how to have uncomfortable conversations Now, I said that correctly, uncomfortable conversations about race with other races. This program has been included in the Government of Canada's 5030 Challenge as a tool to support organizations to have more honest conversations about race. Natalie's latest course is called Beyond Respect, Inclusive Leadership in Conversations About Race and can be found on the Udemy calendar. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you for coming on my show. I'm so looking forward to our conversation. So am I. Thank you so much for having me. Let's set this up in the fact that most people don't know how to have a conversation. They may be interested, but they're afraid to say the wrong things, or they're afraid that that they'll sound stupid or make the person feel defensive. I want you to share that in more detail but this is the problem is maybe we want to advocate we want to support but we're just afraid to do it that's exactly the reason i went into this work people are afraid to have conversations about race because they're uncomfortable because and and i researched when i did this research i asked people of many races what you know how do you feel when you think about having a conversation about race uncomfortable. It's going to be the worst thing in the world. I'm afraid I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings. All the things you shared. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, how will we ever like meet and connect and actually create cultures of inclusion or conversations or and relationships that are inclusive and where people feel like they belong. And the, so the pieces that I've known as a therapist is that the more I leaned into the places that were uncomfortable for me, if I noticed my discomfort and I leaned into where whatever that sensation was one I learned how to be with that emotion and two I understood how that discomfort came to be in the first place so when we think about uncomfortable conversations about race the piece is that you know we are we are learning to you know what's what are all the right things to say what are all the wrong things not to say what should we do what should we not do and it's you know it's a, it's a cognitive approach and necessary however the other piece that is required is this little tweak is also noticing how am i experiencing that all of this information because otherwise i stay in my head and i try to have a conversation with a person and try to say all the right things but i'm not noticing it, which can be uncomfortable because we end up saying the wrong thing mm-hmm. The other thing I need to notice is what am I, what is, what's, what makes me uncomfortable as I have this conversation? Why do I feel like I might say the wrong thing? And so being able to include what, how we work as humans, how we perceive others, how we take in information, how we would create the psychological beliefs that we have about ourselves, the psychological meaning that we have created with our skin. And really filtered and noticed, you know, 
what have I taken in? What do I believe? What are the meanings that I have that I don't even know I might have? And when I explore that, then I can say, I want this or I want that, or I, I'm going to, I agree with this, or this is what I truly believe. And I, I think that point that you're taking is when, when I'm not a, when I have feelings, but I'm not identifying what those feelings are or acknowledging them, that conversation you have with a person, they see something, they see struggle and they don't yep. know why they see it, but that impacts the conversation. And so I love how you say we need to think about that because why I wanted to invite you on is because what you're doing is you're taking it from a different perspective. A lot of people yeah. make these strategic plans yes. and it's, it's trying to create awareness but you've mm -hmm. gone beyond that and looked at how do we, at that grassroots level, have that conversation yeah. so we build trust. We get rid of the awkwardness over time. Mm -hmm. Well, it's true. And I, I believe that there's been a place for those that kind of training. People have to have had to understand on a, you know, at a cognitive level, what, what, are, what does DEIB mean? And then... You know, what I've found and what, and this was the thing that was so interesting to me is that most people still don't know how to have those conversations because what's required after that learning is the inner work. You know, when you hear the term, do the inner work, where the inner work is what is unconscious to me and what am I conscious of? What is my relationship to my racial, my race? What is my racial identity? And like the reason why that's important is because no matter who we are, or how we are, or what we look like, we all have a relationship to that aspect of our identity. And we've had experiences and thoughts and beliefs, all kinds of things that have created a lot of feeling. Well, I know through my psychotherapy background, those meanings and beliefs and experiences that we have had that are unprocessed, they stay with us. Well, when it comes to race, that's a topic that we really haven't really talked about, not in mixed mm -hmm. company, mm -hmm. and haven't processed, you know, what are the emotions that were created out of that? What were the feelings that I've had as a result? And what meaning did I make about myself and other people? And that's the, the stuff that's unawares. And that is true for every human. So yes, I do take a different approach because it's also necessary. You know, and a lot of, you know, as you're, I'm hearing that there's a lot of organizations that are trying to move away from DEI because it's created a lot of division. But the division that's being created has a lot to do with, um, you know, saying someone's right and someone's wrong. I've done this well or I haven't done this well. I'm fragile or I'm not fragile. And the part about it that's, that, like, let me say this. If I'm working with, this conversation is not easy. It's uncomfortable. It's just true. Yeah. The discomfort is because it really is uncomfortable. We've been told a lot of stories about each other. And with, without us even realizing it, we've believed it, right? That's why marketing works. We just, it's, we ingest without even knowing we're ingesting. If we haven't processed how we felt about this uncomfortable topic, the things that we might believe that we don't even know that we believe, the, the thoughts or experiences that we've had that have been painful, traumatic, scary, or may, maybe make us feel superior or inferior, if we don't know that, they, that those experiences still live within us, we will operate out of that place. We'll see the other person out of that place in, from a completely unaware space. You know? So think of it like an aha moment. Like, you know, you have one of those aha moments, that's it like that. Well, I remember I listened to you and Lee talk about your program and you gave and shared an anecdote from your from your birthday party. Would you care to share that with this group? Because that was an aha moment for me thinking about that little girl. She now has a different impression. Do you feel yeah. comfortable sharing yeah. that one? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's the part of the reason why, well, when I was seven years old, I had a birthday party and I remember standing by the window in my living room and my mother was standing beside me and I asked her, would my 
a specific friend be coming to my birthday party? And my, she said, no, she's not coming to your birthday party because maybe because her parents might not want her to come because we're black. And I remember thinking, I'm black? Like, I have a, like, what? And then all of a sudden, in that moment, I became conscious of my skin. Yeah. And my skin took on meaning. Right. So that experience, my mother shared it out of love. She shared it to, you know, want her daughter to know how the world works and might see her. Yeah. And, but she was unaware of, and what happens on a psychological level is that this aspect of my identity took on meaning. And then, therefore, the meaning that I created was, oh, I must not be acceptable to some people because of my skin color. Yes. And then that belief that I didn't even know I was making because I was seven was almost solidified and supported by what I saw in the media, you know, things I heard at school, all of those different pieces created this belief that I must be less than because I'm black. Yes. But when we think about it relationally, if I'm less than, then the other person is better than. Yeah. Yeah. So every so I walked through the world that way and I didn't know that I did until I explored and you know found out through my own therapy process that oh no, I have created this belief from that moment. And I've had many other places where I've thought the same thing and felt a lot of shame about it. And so it was the unearthing of that, the you know, the, the, and having the courage to actually lean in because I didn't want to. When I did, I went, oh, I actually don't believe that about myself. Being black means this, what I decide, not what the world says about me. Right, right. And it was the reclaiming and the ability to own that aspect of my identity. You know, so when I say racial identity, it's like, when did that relationship with that part of yourself begin? Yeah. You know, what's yeah. the psychological connection that you have to being whatever aspect of identity that you are? And we have multiple, right? So uh, uh, yeah. when you shared that story on Lee's podcast, all of a sudden I'm thinking back to, to me and, yeah. you know, I grew up really happy I knew I was Chinese and other people were white or whatever color. And I remember one day coming back from school, I had, I'd drawn this beautiful picture. I was on a high, I was walking and all of a sudden three boys came up and they used a derogatory slang about my ethnicity. And then they even did the little eye thing. And I'm going, really? Like, I, I kind of was indignant that they would do that, but I was also saddened that that's the way the world sometimes is, and some people are like that. So it is hurtful. It is hurtful. Mm -hmm. And I, I applaud you for creating this approach, because I'm pretty sure it's novel. I don't think a lot of people are doing this saying and believing that conversations about race are possible. And... I think you sort of said, when you get curious about your relationship to your own identity, that's when you can open up and have those conversations with others. Because perhaps sometimes if we're not sure, we may feel defensive rather than proud of who we are and educating others about yeah. different is better. Our nuances are different. And personally, people know I love people. And I love learning about different things. And I remember when my husband and I had our company, I would ask people, you know, what did they do on the, the weekend or what did they do for their holiday? You know, a special mm -hmm. Diwali or something. And I realized we all, regardless of race or ethnicity, we all celebrate community with food, right? Yeah. 
And, and so I thought, this is the common denominator. And, and many people have dumplings, whether they call them pierogies. Yeah, or, right. or, 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 or In whatever. Jamaica, we call them uh, Johnny some cakes. kind of dumpling, and we name it the way we yeah, want it. But we name it the name inside it. is some tasty so meat with a, a filling and, and, a, and a, a cover, crusted, fried, or steamed, Actually, or whatever. In Jamaica, it's patties. Yeah, we have patties. Pat See, yeah, Jamaican patties. And, yeah, yeah. and Ukrainians love their pierogies, and we love yeah. our dim sum. <laughs> Just, yeah, it's so good. It's true. It's there's a commonality amongst all of us. And the the idea of, you know, creating a conversation around the place where we're common so we can speak about our own uniqueness, right? Like I am Jamaican and my parents were born in Jamaica and they're here, but I've got this mishmash of cultures like i've got a great grandfather who's chinese i've got uh you know uh, all different kinds of nationalities and i present as a jamaican in my unique way and a canadian in my unique way and you will present as someone who's chinese in your own unique way and that's the thing if we only if we don't get curious about what are the ways in which i'm showing up around this aspect of myself what have I believed? If I don't know that, I'll continue to show up in that way. And finding the place where, you know, once we can get comfortable around, you know, what happens when I say, what happens when I, you know, think of this memory or what happens when I say this, have this conversation with you. And I notice, oh my gosh, I feel a little tense right now. Or I'm noticing, you know, I had this quick thought that if I say this, maybe you'll think less of me. And you know, when you have a, a group of people able to have that kind of conversation that has to be psychologically supported, but when people can talk about their own unique relationship and experience with race and know that it's just someone else's story, it just happened to be this way, then we all, we can we can learn about each other by getting curious about yourself and knowing that what I'm experiencing from a psychological, emotional, somatic level, knowing that that's the, we're all experiencing those things from a human perspective, we create a common language. We create a common way to have a conversation, but we have to start with having a conversation with ourselves or knowing ourselves, understanding ourselves. So do you think it's better when people kind of look at who they are to understand who they want to be and who and who they are? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So you that, have that's to start with where you one. are. It's not just trying to have a conversation Absolutely. to get to know somebody else because no. in order to get to know somebody else, you need to get to know who you are. Right. 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 Yeah. I remember right. in my, in my teenage uh, young adult years mm -hmm. thinking, I need to understand who I am more. And I grew up where my brother didn't even speak English when he first started school. He only knew our Cantonese at home. And going to school was embarrassing because he didn't even know what the teachers were saying. So he had to take some wow. English classes, which he caught on fairly quickly. And then by the time I got to school, I was okay. But over the years, each one of us, like the youngest speaks less Chinese because we just spoke to him in English the whole time. So by the time I became um, a young adult, I thought, I want to know more about my Chinese heritage. And a group of us actually created the Chinese Cultural Heritage Reorientation Program. <laughs> but we offered, we offered like 10 different sessions with some of our Chinese elders on calligraphy, on cooking, on Tai Chi. And so it was a reawakening and an understanding of who I am. And I remember thinking, you know, I have some Chinese and if I want to ha keep it, then what I need to do is I need to start practicing my Chinese. So mm -hmm. people would say, oh, Hilda, someone's from Hong Kong. Can you speak English to her? Mm -hmm. Yes, I will speak English to her if she'll speak Cantonese, I'll speak Cantonese to her. She can guide me and correct me, and I will help her with speak her English. So oh. it was a kind of a win win situation. But that was my identity, my determination to get it back. And the other day I was down at U of T campus, and some people came upon me and they started talking Cantonese. And 
And then I finally said in Cantonese, you know, I was born here. I only speak a little. And we were able to carry on a conversation and they validated that, wow, your Chinese is pretty good. Wow. So I think there's, I hear you, there's conscious effort to learn how you are, how you respond so that you can right. have more comfortable conversations. Is That's right. That's exactly it. And you're, let, let, can I ask you a question? Sure. When you think about, when you think about, you know, how you felt and how, how you felt before you started that journey versus after you started that journey, would it be the same or different? I think there was this interest, this curiosity to learn more and to find other teenagers who were also doing that. And so just creating that program, like who should we invite? Oh, we know so-and-so's mother is a, is a, a, a painter and so-and-so knows somebody for Tai Chi and stuff. So there was this excitement and a sense of pride knowing more. I think on average, I know more about my Chinese history. I know more about the Chinese history in in Canada and Toronto than most of my colleagues. They don't they don't know that, and and young people don't know that. But it's a rich history, and I'm very proud of it. And I guess I'm very proud of the journey that I've created. And I have more respect for all races because I can assimilate my experiences to what they must feel about their yeah. race, their experiences. Thanks for asking. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So there's like that sense of self, the owning of this is my identity and like reclaiming it for what does it mean for you? Yeah. You know, it brings like, you know, even as you described that, that, you know, the, you walking up to some students uh, and have you, it's easier for you to say, because you're like, this is just me. Yeah. This is just who I am, you know? And I feel that so many people are afraid because they haven't really explored what does it mean to be the race that I am that is that's separate from what the world says and and say this is who I am for me then you can lean into a conversation but I believe that understanding how do we psychologically get there how do we get to a place where we didn't know that also needs to be known that also needs to be known and it's been it hasn't I believe that supporting that it's okay to feel uncomfortable about this. It's okay to feel scared and not know how to process the shame or the <clears throat> the fear or the sad, whatever that is. Yeah. Without that, those tools, what we do as humans is just keep it buried. Yeah. And race is one of those topics where it's so emotionally loaded. We're, we don't want to. We're not leaning into places that will feel dangerous or feel you know so uncomfortable without the understanding that. You know what? We're all we all got dropped into this pool of systemic racism. How did you? What, what did you swallow when you swallowed the water? You know, what did you swallow? What did you swallow? And when we know what we swallowed, it's like, oof, I don't want that anymore. You know, or so, I do, or I'm going to keep it. So I know that in our conversation, you want to take the audience through an experiment to explore things. Yeah. Do you want to do that now, or yeah. So <clears throat> for your audience, so. Just so we start, I always include what's happening within our body. So what's happening somatically. So just take a moment and notice what it's like to be sitting on the chair that you're on. Or if you're standing, notice what it feels like just to get into your body and just do a little scan. You know, notice what your seat feels like, what the couch feels like that you're on. Um, and outside so I can feel the air on my skin. Okay. And just let yourself get kind of centered. And so then I invite you to think about, a, you know, maybe an early memory that you had about race. An interaction, an experience as you shared, Hilda. You know, and as you think of that, one of those memories, maybe a dialogue that you saw. Now notice what changes in your body. Notice if there's a tightness. Notice if your breath remains the same or does it change? Does it get a bit more limited? Do you feel a squeezing? Or maybe you feel completely relaxed. And so 
I noticed a squeeze inside when I thought of an, an old memory. And Hilda, what about you? What did you notice? So I, I use that memory that I shared about my so proud of my artwork, and just yeah, my gut was like tight like a ball, and I could feel the anger and and almost like you almost want to disown your race because you've been so humiliated and embarrassed by it. Like, yeah. no, no, don't do that. You know, I'm different. I'm I'm not this color. Peel it off, kind of stuff. Because you're right. When people do that, they make you question who you are. Mm -hmm. It's true. I, I, and I, I, and when I happened for me, I thought of a memory that even when I think about that, I thought of a memory from, you know, when I was younger and it's the same. It, it's like a, a shrinking. I had more of a shrinking inside. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't really get angry. I had more of a shrinking, you know, now. Knowing that, as you shared, like knowing that you felt feel some anger, yeah. What do you? What do you know now? What About do you know now? That incident or me? You. My journey has been one of finding me, and the, all the aspects of me: my Asianness, my love of ballet, my love of people, and I feel very powerful and confident in who I am and my mission in this world. So I'm in a good place right now and I embrace all the bits and I love the fact that I am Asian and that I am confident in who I am and Asian is part of it. So I think I've made that conscious journey throughout life that the, the getting that Asian the Cantonese language to a point where if I don't tell somebody, I can have a conversation and they realize that really you were born here. How do you speak with the oh, right wow. accent fluently? They can't use, they can't use a uh, university fluency language, right? Cause most right. of my language stopped at the age of five. In fact, mm -hmm. when I worked in the hospital, I sometimes late at night, they would, they would look for people to interpret for people. And then I thought, my mother taught me how to go caca and not toilet. <laughs> I have to learn the proper language for toilet because it's very embarrassing as a 20-year-old <laughs> using baby language. <laughs> so so it, it's been a fun journey. And I, yeah, I embrace the bits. But you have to yeah. you have to be conscious of it for sure. You have to exactly. be conscious of it. So in that example, you notice the anger and what maybe you have, what that, what you, you shared even a little bit of what the meaning was that was created out of that experience. Like yeah, yeah. I wanted to slough off my Asianness and not be me. Yeah. And then when you can look at it now and say, okay, wait a second, you were angry for a reason. And that may have changed how you saw other people who were of that same race, whoever those people were that would make yeah, those comments. Yeah. And now as you look at it, it's like, wait a second, this is who I am. This is what I bring. This is how I demonstrate what Asian looks like in the world. An Asian person who was born in Canada, who has a love for her race. It's, an, it's a reclaiming and an owning that aspect of self without the shame of knowing, wait a second, I did think that about myself because I had this experience way back when. And once we can make that differentiation and know also what did it, how did it make me see the other person? Yeah. Then it's like, okay, that was just an experience I had. I've had these, I had this response or reaction. And now I know now what is actually true. Yeah. And that means that I might see the other person when I was younger, saw the, you know, someone who was white as better than, and I saw myself as less than. And now I just see myself as an equal. You know, yeah. we're just two people on this journey, right? And maybe, and, maybe now yeah. reflecting on, on it with you, it probably was a catalyst. Maybe not that day, but maybe yeah. it was a catalyst to get more comfortable in who I am and, yeah. and embrace all the bits of me um, to do, to be determined, to be just find who I am and be who I am so that I can 
have those uncomfortable conversations more comfortably because I know where I am. And so when I have that conversation, it doesn't look like I have mixed messages because the inside feels I'm okay kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and understanding, you know, when we understand, wow, you know, I am a human that is experiencing this. I feel ashamed when I make a mistake or I say the wrong thing, or I feel scared when I'm about to have an uncomfortable conversation. There's something about, even in this moment, you know, we're talking about our experiences. When we, when we can talk about what we're experiencing in the present, it's like, oh, well, well, you're uncomfortable and I'm uncomfortable, but I think you're okay. You know, or I'd like to learn a little bit more about you. Yes. So the emotion gets in the way and we, and it actually stops us. It's, I'm not saying that we're supposed to feel and, you know, you have to lean into those, you know, whatever feeling you're having, but actually just be curious because our, even our resistance is about something. You know, our resistance is telling us something about us. You know, I'm, I'm going to use that word very specifically. This, the part of us in our body that makes us sort of hold ourselves and hold back is actually a very normal human response of to keep ourselves safe, you know, for, and we don't maybe know what that reason is, but it, it's, I want to say, it just doesn't mean that we don't want to have a conversation about race. It, it's telling that resistance tells us something about ourselves. It's like, you know, the human reaction of like touching a hot stove. If I walk by that hot stove again, I'm going to shrink a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That, response is an emotional human response and understanding wait a second i was burned back then but let me find a place of safety so that i can actually respond to the person in front of me not whatever memory whatever experience whatever story i've been told in the past you know that is important i think the key message i'm hearing is part of the journey to have those more comfortable race conversations is to really understand yourself better. Yeah. Before we end, I really want then to help people. Okay. Maybe I'm not quite, you know, quite confident in my journey yet, but I want to learn about others and I want to open up that conversation. What suggestions do you have for people? Okay. My suggestion is, just when you're walking around in your day-to-day, you know when we're walking around and we have that constant, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, and we're sort of, you can feel yourself up in your head. Drop down into your body, like I had suggested, you know, in the earlier experiment, and notice what you think about when you're interacting with people that are different from you. See what it's like to just slow down your thought process, you know, what are you about to say to the person who's in front of you? Do you actually know? Or is it a quick assumption because we're trying to be right or familiar or whatever? Notice how you, what you think about when you look at other people. We are always, we are taking in so much information and we're not always aware of all the different thoughts that we have, right? I have to share this. Um, uh, we take in... I shared this uh, fact in um, the course. We take in 11 million bits of information in a second, and we only process 40 bits. So all the other information, all the other sensations and, you know, sights, sounds are all coming in, but we don't slow down enough to know, like, what am I thinking about that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So slow down and notice, what do you think about the person who is different from you whatever aspect of identity maybe it's a different difference of opinion but notice how does it hit you know what do you how how do you take in that person and then really be conscious of how are you responding you know are you responding from a an assumption assumption are you making an assumption or are you actually curious you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so it, it it happens so quickly you know I I shared a uh, an example on the um, Lee's podcast of an HR director who yeah. um, had a new employee, and 
you know, she was trying to be familiar and she was trying to, you know, just engage with this person. And she said, she was from Nigeria, this new employee. And she said, oh, you must be here to build a better life. And she noticed something. And this employee, HR director said, I noticed something. And I said, she was in the course at the time, my course at the time. And she's, I said to her, well, you made an assumption. She was like, ugh. But she felt it in her body because she had slowed down and noticed that little, you know, twinge that the, yeah, that the person so made. Tennessee. Yeah. If we're in our head, we're not noticing. Yeah. Yeah. So she went back and she said, I'm really sorry because she had worked on processing and being with what are all these feelings in my body mean and what do they mean about me? And once she was able to know that, like, I mean, I just made a mistake. She went back and leaned in and said, I'm so sorry. And the employee said, you know, it's okay. It's okay. And she said, no, it's not. And she was able to like, they, they were able to resolve. And this employee was like, thank you for seeing me. So important. Imagine that new, that employee now having a boss who really sees her and she felt seen, you know, and I remember that example, you know, being HR professionals, we want to care about people, we want to listen. And, and I, I recall when they, t when the employee talked, no, the life isn't better. You know, we gave up careers to be here yeah. for the future of our children. So no, it's not better. It's actually harder. And yeah, yeah that's a that part. Big, big assumption. <laughs> well, that, a big hit assumption. Me, that hit home for me because I think sometimes we think people leave to come here thinking it's better, but there are so many people. You know, whenever I go away, I, I like to talk to people who are my taxi drivers because they talk about their life, their history. Yeah. And you become yeah. very aware that there is not, it's not always easy for these people um, to overcome, but they do it for their children and for a better life for their children. But overall, yeah. those, those early years, no, you don't no, make it easy no. for them. No, it's, it's true. So the, our curiosity creating it's the initial knowing or the initial curiosity about your own self that, and really understanding that plus understanding what happens with me emotionally yeah. that allows you to show up in those conversations in a different way. And thank you for sharing that piece because I was sharing it quickly, but yeah, that woman had wealth back home. She had nannies. She had family <laughs> friends. She, she didn't come here because it was better. So, but these, that assumption can be so quick and we miss it because we're trying to, we are trying to connect. Yeah. But sometimes in the trying to connect, we're just trying to say the right thing. We only got those 40 bits, those other person. thousand plus. Right. <laughs> just go whoosh. Yeah. 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 A any other pieces of advice you would like to share with people? I, I find our conversation, you know, has been fascinating and hopefully resonated with people to have conversations and how do you create those initial ones? The awkward moments will disappear once you build that know, like, and trust, but I'd love for you to share any other things you feel we should be talking about before we have to end our conversation. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I started with people getting to know them themselves or actually just slowing down. That's the one, that's the first piece. Okay. But the second, like just to, you know, to give people um, a little bit of an experiment, get curious about what you actually think about race. You know, when you, you don't have to go out and have conversations. You can, you, you may, but even if the truth is like, I feel uncomfortable having this conversation, start with that. You know, if you, so I, I, I urge you all to really notice how do you actually feel having a conversation about race and what, how do you want to feel, you know, and notice the people that you may want to connect to and learn about. And you don't because of what you imagine that conversation will be like. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a simple thing that I'm saying, but it's so big because we walk around with that. Either we're holding back or we're imagining, you know, a, a terrible future all the time, as opposed to and stopping and saying, like, what do I actually think about race? You know, 
and knowing that maybe there's a lot of parts of you that, you know, think of your memories, think of your experiences, how have they defined you, you know? And if once you feel it in the present right now, you'll know that those experiences still live with you. And if you're curious to explore that, then you can join my program. So Natalie, tell me about your signature program, the Comfortable Race Conversation Process. The Comfortable Race Conversation Process program is a, it's an online program, but it's comprised of two parts. The, there is an asynchronous portion, which is three recorded videos and supplementary homework where you can listen to that on your, in your own time. The, the other part of the program is really where transform, transformation happens. There's practice circles. The practice circles are 90 minute live workshops that are facilitated by myself. And I'm a psychotherapist. And that piece, so what's essential and foundational in this program is creating psychological safety and teaching people about one, what psychological safety means, two, how we respond as humans and how we work emotionally and how our brains work and perceive information. And three, understanding our racial identity, what we've been talking about all this time this in this podcast. What is my experience in, and, and my identity in relation to race? Or Sorry, over the seven weeks, through those practice circles, all of the participants are learning about their own relationship, their own stories, their own experiences, and really you know, and having conversations with each other, not about someone else, but about themselves with whatever they feel comfortable to share. Over that time, they've had so many conversations. By the end, they feel extremely comfortable having a conversation about race. And in fact, mo- like every cohort I have, they I just actually had a, a reunion practice circle call today, right before this, because people feel a connection because there's we there's this is the place where we're the same so the program starts october the 4th and that's when you get the first module with all of the you know information it is consumed over the week and then on october the 11th every friday after that from 10 to 11 30 we will meet and that's when the practice circles start and then once that practice circle is done you get module two we consume that information and then we meet for the next practice circle and we, you know, we experiment and explore with that information. And over time, over the, the program, you really come to know yourself in a, in a totally different way. And just, it's, there's so much to talk about when it comes to race. So much that we haven't we, talked about. I know we've just touched yeah. a little bit of it. I can see how being able to talk about your identity in a safe space and hear other people's identities in their race, it is it is collectively transformative, not just personally transformative. How do people get a hold of you, Natalie? You can look up the Comfortable Race Conversation Process mm-hmm. and on um, on online. Um, my Instagram is at uh, Natalie Haynes Consulting. My LinkedIn is Natalie Haynes Consulting. You can look me up at Natalie Haynes also on LinkedIn. And if you can spell Natalie. Uh, it's N-A-T-A-L-I-E. And my last name is H-A-Y-N-E-S. And, you know, if you have any questions, please reach out. Um, so I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. And look up the Comfortable Race Conversation Process. And you can find out more. And if you have any questions or you're a little nervous, um, let's have a conversation. because. It really is transformative. I'm very proud of it because it's, it is, I feel like the tweak that's been needed, you know, so that we can lean into these conversations and feel safe, psychologically safe doing so. Yeah. And whenever that's created as humans, once we have that awareness, it's like, oh, I know now this, I know this now, well, I can do something different now. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It is transformative yeah. because when you know yourself better and you have more confidence in who you are, it just makes life different. Absolutely. So amazing. So I, I appreciate you for building this, having the passion to make it happen. Like I, I have a passion for helping people be positive in, and do it in my own way of doing energy. I love the way you have done it. 
in a way that really helps people with their identity and race being it it is a part of you you can't you can't it's hide different. like you can't peel it off skin. like I yeah thought. it's our largest it's our largest <laughs> organ skin's our largest organ yeah. like yeah. we have to come to terms with the meanings that we've created about it so yes. and thank we, you. I just have to know what we have yeah Yes. Well, thank you for thank creating you. this. Thank you for coming on my show. And if those people are interested, they know how to get a hold of you. And thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Natalie. Well, thank you so much, Hilda. I loved this conversation. Thank you for tuning in to Rev Up Your Business with Hilda Gann. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our podcast on YouTube and Spotify to stay up to date with all of our latest episodes. For more HR tips, strategies, and to learn how you can create a people-centric workplace, visit our website at peoplebrightconsulting.com.